Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, SDR Technical Series webinar, introducing the DXA 2.0 release. My name is Christina and I will be your host today. Before the webinar, I have a few housekeeping items to cover about this webinar. First, today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session through the same link you are using right now. And also recording will be shared shortly after the webinar. Second, please feel free to send questions in the Q&A box. We will be answering your question at the end of the session. If you don't get any answer during the webinar, we will follow up afterwards. Now I will hand over to Bart to begin the presentation. Thank you, Christina. Welcome, everybody, uh, to this webinar of introducing uh, the DXA 2.0 release. Um, let me go over the agenda uh, quite quickly. I'm not doing this uh, webinar alone. I'm doing it together with uh, uh, two of our lead developers, uh, Paul and Alexi. I'll be uh, um, walking you through a short introduction, handing over to Paul um, so he can give you some details uh, of the .NET side of the DXA 2.0 release. He will then hand over to Alexi for the Java parts. And at the end, I will uh, finish up with uh, a short uh, a bit of information about the future of DXA and where we're going. So let's uh, uh, take a quick look at, uh, at the features. Um, Basically, we have released DXA 2.0 uh, February 13th, and um, on the left-hand side, uh, you, you see the list of, of the features we have added. Um, so we have a new data model, the R2 data model. Uh, we have improved our publishing pipeline. We've added a custom resolver, the DXA resolver. Um, we also have new CAL.NET extension points. We have improved caching. Um, we added the model service, um, which yeah, gives us uh, uh, the data compatibility with the DD4T, but also improves uh, um, uh, the performance of the DXA. Uh, um, and uh, specifically for DD4T backwards compatibility, we added uh, a DD4T provider which connects towards that model service. And um, we've also described um, some information about uh, how you migrate from older applications, be that DXA or, or DD4T. The technical details of all of this um, will be explained by, uh, by Paul and Alexi. Uh, a lot of that is also what you can find within our documentation. Um, but let's uh, take a look uh, uh, quickly at a, bit, a few of the benefits. So in conclusion, DXA 2.0 offers improvements across the board. Um, we used this release not only as the merge between uh, DD4T and DXA, but also to drive improvements in, in like the CIL library um, and uh, caching and extensibility and, and, and configurability. Um, I will uh, talk more about that when we talk about the future of DXA. Um, the model service, which I just mentioned, that's um, partially there to reduce the code complexity and, and reduce the code duplication between uh, uh, the DXA web applications, since we have those in, in .NET and Java. Um, it's also there, uh, and, it, and it plays an important role to provide the compatibility between DD4T and DXA. Um, one important thing to mention about the model service is that the model service is not considered uh, as public API for DXA 2.0. Um, we've added and introduced a new data model. You might have seen that mentioned already in, in my blog posts earlier about the new architecture uh, on the CTP releases. This new data model um, is there to make things easier to understand and quicker to work with. 
uh, and it's also sit clo sits closer to the domain it was intended, uh, so delivering us uh, a bunch of improvements. And then on the content manager side, we have a template building blocks and a resolver basically there uh, changed to make life easier when you are publishing content. Um, that's briefly it um, from my side for now. Uh, let me hand over to Paul for the first five features. Afterwards, he will hand over to Alexi, who will then uh, discuss uh, the last four. Over to you, Paul. Okay, cheers, Bart. So a quick introduction. Okay, so we'll start off with the uh, the data model, which is what you've probably heard a lot about, and it's uh, a little bit of history actually. Uh, so DXA started life as a as part of uh, well using DD4T, and the DD4T has its own uh, content model, uh, and DXA had a bunch of template building blocks publish content using the DD4T content model. Now the content model that DD4T uses is quite close to the Tridian content model. And DXA's view model architecture uh, is a lot different. So what was happening is DXA would be publishing content to D as DD4T content. And then in the uh, web application, it would then transform the DD4T content model into a view model which DXA would then use. So it was kind of like an intermediate model. So the question is, why not just go directly from Tridian's content model directly to a view model? So that was the kind of idea behind it. it had a, it's got a few side effects, though. Uh, the first is it's kind of like, well, you're losing DD4T. and there's quite a big community of people using DD4T, as you kind of know. So it was like, so that decision was kind of a, a difficult one to make. But it was like the future of DXA was moving towards uh, being used in the more areas of uh, SDL. Uh, uh, so it was kind of, yeah, so that's basically what we decided to do. Um, um, yeah, so, so the actual content model I will show you tomorrow, uh, the, the view model and the, the JSON that's uh, created, but it's it's more like what you'd expect. So um, whereas in DXA you have regions and, uh, and, and so on, it's more model view controller-like. Uh, so, um, and it's, it's a bit more abstract and less verbose. If you were to look at the content model that we used to use, it's quite large, and a lot of the information in there is redundant. It's not actually used by DXA. So part of the uh, the move to this uh, new data model was the reduction of that data. It make, makes it a lot easier to read, and it's um, a bit cleaner. OK, so so as part of that, the uh, the new template, build, the, there was a bunch of template building blocks that were uh, kind of not redone completely, but kind of re-architected. So the old uh, template building blocks, again, they used to use DD4T and then and push that to the broker. But now we've basically changed that slightly. And so that it handles all the uh, stuff itself. It doesn't use DD4T anymore. OK, so and then of course, it's serialized as JSON. And we've also um, uh, cleaned up the location where these template building blocks live within the content manager. So they, they were a little bit kind of mix and match because you had DXA templates, DD4T templates, and maybe some custom templates. And they were kind of mixed in the same kind of like folder. So they're quite tricky to kind of like navigate around. So part of this work, we kind of cleaned up how that, how that looks. Um, Another another part of it is the uh, the expansion of uh, link components. That's no longer done uh, inside the template building blocks, and uh, so we have a mechanism where we can basically put a placeholder ID for link components, and that expansion is then uh, deferred uh, onto the model service, uh, which you'll hear about by Alexi later. So that was kind of the idea, and kind of dropping DD4T reducing, uh, uh, simplifying the data model, and just 
there's no XML serialization like the old DD4T. It's just pure JSON. It's very, it's what you kind of would imagine it to be. Uh, the, if you were to serialize a view model in DXA, that's basically what you see in the JSON that's published by the template building box. Okay, so talk about that. So part of the uh, the way we control the expansion of link components in this uh, in the publishing pipeline now is we've introduced uh, this uh, custom resolver, which is uh, kind of like a hook into the publishing pipeline that Tridian offers, and it's been there been around for a while, but we've made use of it in DXA because we've got this new uh, data presentation template, which you can link. Uh, you can add your link schemas to, de to determine what gets expanded and what doesn't. And uh, but a kind of like a downside of that is if you when you what you need to be able to publish components against this particular uh, uh, template. So we've introduced this uh, custom resolver, which automatically does that for you. So you don't have to remember to to publish a load of content. It will actually it will go through. Uh, the items that you're publishing and look through all the link components and then and then automatically publish them for you okay so we also have a, a new UI extension in the in the content manager to allow you to specify what we call it the recursion depth but if you was to publish a component that linked to another one and that linked to something else and that linked to something else you'd have to remember to uh, publish make sure all those link components are published but with this custom resolve it, it just automatically does it for you. And of course, the recursion depth uh, by default is set to infinite, so it will just go, it will keep going until it reaches the end of the chain, uh, making sure that it doesn't, uh, there's no like cyclic loops in there and so on. But you can set that to whatever value. Uh, it's, uh, but that, the kind of UI extension is, is the beginnings of a bit more kind of like uh, user control on, on how publishing is done in DXA as opposed to, to make it a bit more clear. Okay. So part of the uh, DXA2 is a new uh, model builder pipeline. And this model builder pipeline exists in the DXA web application. But we've taken the kind of concept of that and introduced it into the template building, uh, building blocks. So if you wanted to customize the uh, the, the the kind of like uh, template building blocks, uh, you would generally just create a brand new template building block. But now, but in the DXA web application, you could also customize the data model builder. And it had like, a, it had a data model builder pipeline and you could just uh, hook into its extra builders that you could chain. So we've taken that concept and introduced it into the template building blocks. So now you can chain, so you don't have to create multiple template building blocks. You can have one template b uh, building block and just pass it the, the name of, a, of a, a template builder, if you like, that, that gets executed on the data model. And the, it's a, kind of like a sequential kind of thing going on there. So like the first one, the default, takes the uh, Tridian content model and then builds the R2 data model. So you've got an entire data model structure, and then it will call the next one in the chain, and then that one can operate on the, the data model that got produced from the previous uh, uh, data model builder. And that way, and the, the, uh, one of the reasons why we did that is because if you was to create it with, like, say you had a, a custom template building block that wanted that compressed the output, you'd have to, de every time you ran a template building block, it would have to deserialize the data model, do its thing, and then re-serialize it. And now we've, and that, and by using this architecture, it eliminates the the need to constantly uh, deserialize and serialize the data model. So it's done once. You operate on that data model, which is much easier kind of thing to work on because you're just working with a, a simple like uh, classes and so on. And then there's a, and then the final thing is that it serializes. So you don't have to worry about dealing with that. Um, the, the downside slightly is that you can't uh, see these individual uh, data model builders in the content manager. So you would have one template building block 
uh, class if you're a, a C sharp object that's uploaded to the t uh, CM, and then and that contains multiple data model builders. Uh, so you'd have to know those existed. So that would be a bit of a documentation issue, but there you go. Um, So another uh, part of DXA is because we're trying to push DXA and it's going to be used uh, by a lot of other things in the future, it, it became a good driving force for changes across other areas in, uh, in Tridium. So one, one point is the, uh, the UDP stack. Uh, the DXA makes use of the SIL library. and It kind of when it's it's like almost a perfect test harness for the for the SIL and the UDP stack, and it, it kind of like shows areas that you know you, we wished we had. So, so part of the uh, so the work that went on with DXT2, it came obvious that we needed to do some extra things, and which the SIL library originally didn't do. So, so it meant that we've added. We've managed to like add extra stuff to the civil library, which probably wouldn't have ever been done before, and that's the that's the kind of benefit of uh, uh, of DXA driving this type of stuff because it's like these types of things would probably never get raised. So now you can like extend the seal, and the, and because it was driven by a D DXA enhancement, we've done it in the same way as you'd extend DXA. So in DXA, if you wanted to add uh, some custom implementation of something. You'd use Unity and uh, for the dependency injection, and you can do the same now in the SIL. So, um, if you look, if you look back on previous versions of DXA and DD4T, uh, primarily if you look at the, uh, the SIL providers that DD4T uses, you you you'll end up with uh, there's login in the SIL. There's login in DD4T, there's login in DXA, and they're, they're all separate. And so it kind of uh, becomes a bit messy. So it's nice to be able to have them all using the same logging service, the same OAuth provider, claim store provider, and, and all these types of things. And you can just plug in implementations. The default implementations are how they used to be. But now you could have one implementation that did all the login, and so DXA, DD4T, and the SIL library would share the same log file and log all the configuration settings for that. Um, it just brings everything a bit closer, a bit more kind of like, it, it seems more coherent in the way it all works, as opposed to separate configurations for SIL, separate configurations for DXA. And it, it seems a bit kind of like mismatch, or kind of disjointed. So it's helped to, uh, to kind of like solidify that sort of stuff. Okay, so we've improved the caching, and again, uh, DXA2, we wanted to do uh, caching the entire model, okay? So uh, the view models, the, uh, and basically everything we wanted to be able to cache. But originally, DXA only had like an uh, in-memory cache, and also because it used to use DD4T, DD4T had its own caching mechanism. With the new changes in the SIL, we've introduced um, uh, kind of like a much more kind of involved uh, caching mechanism. And it's taken some kind of concepts and ideas from DXA, actually, uh, DD4T, sorry. So we've got cache regions where you can, you can, spec, you can output stuff to a particular cache region and, uh, and group it. And, we, and you can target a cache region to use a different particular a different cache. So you could have an in-memory cache for cer certain things, a distributed cache for something else. And this caching mechanism, it's, there's one configuration point for it. DXA uses it, and the SIL library uses it. So there's no longer like multiple caches, and you and you never know which, uh, where the caching exists, it, it, in what seconds to change. It's just one configuration. To sort it all out, uh, and we fixed up the caching as well. We've rationalised the configuration for it, so it's a bit cleaner. It's easier to disable, and um, and you've got sliding and absolute expiration times on it as well. Whereas, like originally, there was it was just fixed at a sliding, 
expiration, so we fix that. And we've also added uh, output caching, which I'll talk about in a second. Here we go. <laughs> so, um, so we've always had like regular output caching that MVC uh, ASP.NET provides, but we improve that so we allow that the, the the kind of vanilla uh, output cache can be configured to use uh, the SIL cache, which is cool. But also, um, output page caching is li it is literally everything or nothing. And if there's any dynamic entities on the page, you just you can't use output caching. So we've added an extra. We've added a better output caching mechanism, which is which supports dynamic uh, entities on the page. Uh, I put that you know it as donut caching, which is a name that uh, a lot of people use on the on the internet, where basically everything you can output everything and cache it as a page. But if there's one element that's on that page that's dynamic, it kind of punches a hole through it. So the page gets built up from cached elements, and then once it finds the dynamic elements, it then goes off and actually uh, calculates that value again, so that never gets cached. And you can uh, use it just like you could do with the old uh, ASP.NET mechanism. You just annotate your class with uh, a couple of attributes to determine whether it uses it or not. And like I say, it's using the exact same caching configuration as everything else now. So you can you could you could have your output cache go to a distributed cache if you wanted, or you could have it as a small in memory cache. You know, it, it, it it's pretty flexible like that. And viewable caching. Okay, so it's the same thing, but uh, previously we couldn't uh, serialize view models uh, fully. But now we can. We've improved that. So now they all they can be fully serialized as JSON, and because they can be fully serialized, we can then cache them anywhere. And so we have a re, we have support for a redis distributed cache, which so you can then serialize your data and just send it there. And you can use cat and with cache regions, you don't have to send all your view models to a distributed cache. You could you could you could send some to one distri one distributed cache, some to another. So to an in-memory cache, it's up to you. Obviously, with distributed caching, you kind of have to weigh up the uh, kind of. It's a bit of a balancing act, anyway. Caching, it's like it takes. It might take longer to serialize and cache than it does to uh, just to recalculate the value. Okay, so I've covered distributed caching. It's available, uh, and also um, with the new DXA model service provider. Uh, which is just like the SIL uh, provider that D, uh, DD4T has. Uh, it's, it's that, but it's built, and it will use the model service to get uh, DD4T content back. Again, it also provides a, a, a default cache provider implementation, which you can then just plug directly into your DD4T applications through whatever dependency injection mechanism you wish. And then you'll automatically get the benefits of, of um, distributed caching. So even so, yeah. So even people that don't want to migrate directly to DXA2, they can still get some benefits from the new SIL extension points, shared login, shared caching, and so on, through this DXA model service provider. Okay, so multi-level caching. Got a lot of caching going on here, but. Um, so the the idea of this is again it's just just an, another improvement. It's like it's great to have dis, distributed caching. It's great to have in memory caching, but it's sometimes it's a bit of a pain to kind of work out what bit should go where. It's like so the idea of this is it's basically chaining caches together. So at the at the front is a, a level one cache, which is a small in memory cache. You can configure the size, and then uh, when you get a cache miss from, from the level 1 cache, then you go to the level 2 cache. The level 2 cache could be a distributed cache, and you could have multiple ones of those. So you could have those uh, spread over m multiple instances, and they could go down, and uh, it wouldn't have any effect. It just iterate, it just go through looking 
and once it pulls it from the level two cache, it then puts it into the level one cache. So if you have multiple requests coming in at a, in a quick, uh, a lot of requests quickly in a short space of time, then it will have, that will have warmed the level one cache up, added it in there, and then you will just have an in-memory cache. So it's a way of kind of like um, buffering really the the, the caches. That's it. That's it from me. <laughs> so over to Alexi, who will probably talk to you about the model service and uh, the new uh, uh, DD40 providers. Yes. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. So my name is Alexi, and uh, I'm going to walk you through what's changed in Java, and I I'm going to show you model service and model service providers, as that, as Paul said, and uh, I also will introduce you how you can migrate from your application to DXA2. Um, so, I will start also with caching. Uh, I'm happy that I'm not going to tell so much about caching because actually what Paul said is also true for Java with small differences though. Uh, the biggest difference in the XA Java caching is that in uh, we didn't have any Java ca any, any caching in the XA Java before release 2.0. There was of course CL and dd 4 caches but uh, in DXA, all the semantic mapping uh, was done for each request. In DXA2, we, introdu we introduced uh, full caching on many layers, and also we have caching to model service. This reduced request time on a warmed application from around uh, 400 milliseconds per request down to 40 milliseconds, and these numbers I got from our load test, and of course, for other environments, it may be bigger or lower number, but it's for sure that the performance has increased much. Then, uh, we also introduced output caching, and this is the layer which is the closest to what you actually see in browser, and uh, it gives you the fastest, fastest responses you get. We have cache for pages, we have cache for entities, we basically cache everything that we can cache. And for entities, even if they are found in different pages, you will still find them in cache if uh, this particular entity is already cached. Um, we try not to force you to use multiple cache configurations, so DXA tries to reuse CIL configuration for, for cache, and, and this is possible if uh, CIL is configured to use the general cache provider. Um, Unfortunately, DXA Java doesn't yet support Redis. Um, it's based on the fcache, and uh, it can only can cache in memory. But you, of course, can configure CIL to use Redis cache. Then DXA will just fall back to its own configuration. Or if even if there is no configuration for DXA, it will create everything that it needs uh, using all the default values. So. This is possible for you if you want to use something specific for DXA, something specific for CIL, then you can use complete separate configurations. But um, for simplest cases, you can you will just have single configuration for CIL and for DXA. Uh, then each cache is manageable uh, easily. You can disable caches one by one. You can disable cache only in DXA, or you can disable cache in DXA and CL using just the same config, uh, configuration option. You can even disable caches for a specific view model in your application. So everything will get cached but this view model. This is not applicable for model service. And this is not just because it doesn't support it, it does, but because you're not really supposed to modify model service because uh, like a real example, if model service is deployed in a cloud, then you cannot access it. And uh, if it's uh, run in Docker, then uh, once the Docker is restarted, you lose everything that you configured for model service. But we, of course, don't say that you are not allowed to touch it. You're just not supposed to. <laughs> then that's it for with caching, I think. And let's talk a bit about model service. Model service is one of the biggest features uh, from the xa and this is basically a new service that fits uh, with the rest of UDP services. This is not so much of a model service, but this is a model 
content provider, but it indicates the future direction of how things will be. The concept of this service is quite simple. Instead of having uh, the XA applications written in .NET and Java uh, that request content from UDP and uh, which build the data model, we use an intermediate service, um, which returns you a fully built XA model. This model service can be hosted anywhere, but in the real world, you would deploy it alongside with all the other UDP services. It can also be registered against the discovery service, and so it can be discovered. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a dedicated capability in discovery, and model service registers as a property of content service capability, but it actually makes a, a bit of sense considering that this is not a model service, but this is kind of wrapper around content service. Um, the current implementation of the model service returns JSON serialized data uh, that can be used by DXA application uh, to build a concrete view model. This helps you in several ways. Um, for example, this JSON uh, uh, is adapted for DXA and uh, is easily be easily consumed by uh, DXA application and uh, it's only um, <coughs> implemented in a single artifact so you, it's not spread across application and it's easy, easy to check, easily to use. Uh, then uh, model service is run locally with the content service and DXA application make a single request and which brings all the data uh, to the web application, uh, but normally this data would be uh, built with numerous service calls. And also it helps to maintain the code because we reduce duplication of the code, which was in .NET and Java implementations, now is in model service. Um, model service is uh, just uh, content provider, as I said, and it does not perform semantic mapping. This work is still up to uh, web applications. Another advantage of model service is how easy uh, it is now to keep the uh, data backwards compatible. We implemented a, a set of converters that can convert uh, your dd 4 JSON to R2 format. This is new format, as you know already. Uh, as well as it can convert R2 to DD4T if it's really needed. It even supports when some pieces of data uh, are in one format, but others are in different. It will just detect it and mix it in a single model. This basically means, and this is important, that you don't have to republish your content to start using the new architecture. You can do it step by step. I want to show you how it works? Um, well, we have two publications. Uh, one is published in R2, the second is published in DD4T. And uh, if I request the model service and specify a uh, parameter row equals true, I get exactly what's stored in Brock database. So you see, this is a new content, this is R2. If I then uh, specify the model type R2, I get the same. Because it's stored in a broker database, I request it in this model type, and I get what I requested. But then, if I request the same page in, in a legacy format in DD4T, it is converted. You see? This is the same data, but it's now in different model. The same I, I will show you for a legacy publication. This is a content that's published to broker. Then if I request it in DD4T format, I get the same. But then, if I request it without model type or with model type equals R2, I get R2 content. So this also means that default format is R2. So if you don't specify any model type, you will get R2. Next slide. And this, this allowed us to build the DD4T provider of model service. Because we want people to migrate to new DXA, even from non -co not compatible architectures like DD4T, and for this we created this provider. This 
this is a thing, this is a drop-in artifact, which you just drop into your application, and the application starts to work in a new way. It requests DD4T format from model service. Instead of going uh, through CIL and loading all the pages and component presentations from CIL, and uh, since you now using the model service and you get in the same format, the, all your code that relies on uh, the DD4T format will just continue to work. So it's easier than to start migrating, and and that's why this is probably the best starting point for you to update from your application to DXA. Steps are quite simple. You install model service, you drop a new provider, and start slowly republishing content and uh, writing new code to you, uh, that will use R2 format. The details of how you use this provider differ a bit between .NET and Java, of course, but the general idea is the same, and uh, all the details you can find in documentation in, in our documentation portal. Well, and then let's talk a bit about migration scenarios. Considering all what I just said, uh, we support migration from DD42 to DXA2 for DD40 applications. For DXA applications, you can first upgrade from DXA1X to 1.8 or 1.7, and then you upgrade to DXA2. Uh, there is no much difference between DXA 1.7 and 1.8, uh, and unless you really want to use some specific stuff that was developed for 1.8, you will not notice any difference between these versions. So if you are now on 1.7, you are free to upgrade to DXA 2. Unfortunately for Java, we have an extra step here. Um, for DXA Java, you first need to upgrade DD40 that is used under the hood uh, in DXA 1X because DXA used a uh, custom and non-compatible version of DD4T artifact, and unfortunately this extra, extra step is here now. Good to know, though, uh, that this is not that difficult to upgrade, because DXA didn't introduce any new functionality in DD4T, so you maybe just simply follow the uh, upgrade path from DD4T1 to DD4T2. And that's it for model service and for Java and Thank you, and I give my word to, to, to Bart. Okay, thank you, Alexi. So, um, let's uh, round this, uh, this webinar up with uh, taking a bit of a, a more of a look at the future of DXA. Where do we want to go, and, and what are we starting? Let's uh, start looking back also. Um, here is uh, a slide with um, the actual full roadmap, uh, past and future. Um, right now, we, uh, we are planning to add two additional releases in 2018. Um, they should basically come along with um, the, the Sites 9 and Sites 9.1 release. Um, no guarantees here, this is, this is all just the rough planning, uh, similar to as you've seen uh, with the planning of DXA 2.0. If we need to move, if we need more time, uh, if it doesn't make sense to release early, then, uh, then we will postpone this. But this is the rough plan which we, uh, which we currently have. Then um, a few words around uh, the merge with, uh, with DD4T. Um, if you looked at uh, the DD4T.org website, you uh, might have noticed uh, this message uh, already on, uh, on there. Um, and, and in short, basically DXA 2.0 is a huge milestone towards fully merging DD4T and DXA. Um, the merge is not completely done, um, but as a first step, we basically deprecated uh, DD4T. Um, it will still be maintained by the community as it uh, was in the past, um, but there will no, we will no longer release new features on it. Um, so more details about that you can find on the DD4T.org website. Um, this basically is a trigger for the entire community, you all here, uh, to, to start helping us 
focusing on the future of uh, of, of DXA um, because that is yeah what the whole merge was about that there won't be a, a split look at um, at different frameworks but we're all going to work together. Um, I'm currently still discussing with uh, the steering group which we formed for the merge. That steering group has not been dissolved with the release of, uh, of DXA 2.0. Um, we're still there and we're discussing um, what additional steps still need to be done to complete this merge. And, and also your ideas in there uh, are important. So feel free to, uh, to reach out uh, um, to either me or um, the, the DD4T uh, community owners and, and discuss those things. Let's take a look at, at the future of DXA. So as we started off in the beginning, um, we've used DXA 2.0 and, and DXA over uh, its whole development uh, life cycle to, to drive changes within uh, the SDL 3D and Core product as well. Um, we have successfully changed uh, certain parts of, of UDP. Uh, a good example is also uh, the DXA model service, which is basically um, should evolve into the public content API, which will uh, become part of uh, the 3D and Sites 9 release. Um, the, the DD4T slash DXA template building blocks, they should evolve um, within the data pipeline together with uh, the R2 data model, um, which should yeah, um, give shape towards the Tridian data model, which, uh, which will also uh, start forming as of the, the Sites 9 release. So, um, the future of DXA is to continue to evolve the product, uh, not just DXA as a framework itself, but also the product it is, it is running on. And that goes beyond just uh, SDL 3D Insight. It, uh, it, it hits basically the full SDL 3D and DX, so sites and docs. And together with, uh, with you guys from the community, I'm hoping that we can grow it into the best practice rather than a best practice. Um, there's a few things we already know we want to work on for the future. Uh, things like content mashups uh, between sites and docs. Um, we also have high level plans for delivering uh, a DXA JavaScript, um, which, which basically is um, a, a support for JavaScript client side frameworks through DXA. Um, we need to look at, at, at whether we do that um, as part of uh, an additional uh, module of DXA or if it becomes more of something which lives on the public content API of sites. Um, so we have some ideas. We're, we're going to work those out. When I look then further, um, what I want to do for you guys is I want to open up our roadmap and backlog for more community interaction. Um, everybody has access to, uh, to the source because it's open, um, but yeah, because there's uh, different repositories, you can add your suggestions and your defects, etc., on there, but you don't have a direct view on, on what Tridian itself is, is picking up in the, in the development cycle because that part of the backlog isn't clear. And the roadmap is, is just shared with me through, uh, through blog posts now. So um, I'm working towards yeah, making improvements there so, so that we have some tooling so that yeah, everybody can, can see what's happening uh, and can also start discussing um, and not so much around the pure code, but also interact within design uh, and, and, and also closer in development you will see which features from the roadmap we're currently not planning uh, in, in the next couple of months, and then you can let us know that you would like to pick those up yourself. So more about that um, I'll share with you guys when I have something more concrete. Uh, this uh, basically ends up what, uh, what we had to say. 
Um, I'm now going to hand over to Christina and we'll uh, then start discussing the, the questions which you guys have. Okay, thank you for presenting today. We are now going to open it up the Q&A session. If you have any questions, please enter the question into the Q&A box. We have a couple of questions. The first question is, in the XA previous version, it's not possible to map structure group metadata to model properties. Is this possible in the XA 2.0? Paul, can you answer that? Yeah, um, I believe it is now because we've added a uh, uh, in the template builder block that model builder pipeline I was talking about. There is now one called inherit uh, metadata, which if you add to your list of uh, model builder type names, you'll see that tomorrow. Um, it will add the structure root metadata to the uh, data model, and then from memory, I'm, I'm sure then the DXA model builder on the uh, will then apply semantic mapping and to be able to do that, to, uh, yeah, apply that to properties on the on the uh, on the models. So yeah. So so basically, we're not uh, we we didn't expose a structure group object uh, within our model, but we are allowing you to add the metadata of a structure group towards the page model, and that's how you can map it. Yeah. So that should just work. Yeah. Second question. Environment with SDL Web 8.0 plus classical publishing model. Can it install the X8 2.0 site type not implemented in environment? Uh, so the short answer to that is no. Um, let me elaborate a little bit more. Um, we specifically designed DXA uh, 2.0 and, and actually um, uh, from DXA, um, what is it, 1.5 or 1.6 onwards, I think already when we introduced Web8 support, we uh, specifically mentioned that we will not support the classical publishing model. Um, but that we go on to the topology uh, uh, manager and, and, and the new publishing model. Uh, main reason there is um, the classical publishing model is deprecated, um, so it also did not feel right for us to start a best practice type of implementation on deprecated functionality. Um, plus, there were uh, features and benefits in the topology manager, um, which we wanted to showcase. So for that, we basically, yeah, um, said, um, and that same thing counts for DXA 2.0, um, you will need to migrate away from the uh, classical publishing model, the legacy publishing model, as it's called, and, and go towards uh, topology manager setup. Next question. With the model service in picture, does the web application does not directly interact with the contents broker DB anymore? Is all communication with broker DB handled by the model service? Uh, so no. Um, model service loads only content, and uh, the DC application still talks to uh, CD to, to the CD to load all the metadata. Uh, so, but it. Uh, uh, DXA goes to model service only for content, not for metadata. Yeah, so all binaries and uh, links and so on, that's retrieved through the uh, the SIL libraries on both DXA, uh, Java, and .NET. Okay. Next question. In the XA previous version, you can extend RTF and the link reserving as part of the model building. Is this possible in the XA 2.0? And if so, where do you do this? For example, if you like to add custom processing to reserve link in RTF to the DP, how would I do this? Well, uh, currently link resolving happens in model service, and uh, as Paul already said, we have a special mechanism there, special markers that how uh, uh, we detect, detect these links in RTS. And uh, then 
whatever is not resolved by model service uh, goes to application and uh, there you can uh, you can add some custom converter or something to to resolve what what was not resolved by model service but yeah currently link resolve happens in model service yeah so whatever you can whatever you could do in uh, dxo one point x you can pretty much do in two you can if you need to uh, modify the model building pipeline in in the web application side then you can and likewise if you want to uh intercept or hook onto the uh, the building of the new r two data model in the template building box you can do the same you could override uh, expansion if you like by just not uh, putting the placeholder ID and expanding yourself with some custom logic. That's perfectly doable. Okay. Next question. What are the prerequisites for the X8? So I've added a link in the in the announcement uh, uh, section already uh, to the documentation. Uh, in short, the prerequisites for uh, for DXA 2.0 are that you have um, either SEL Web 8 with Communitive Update 1 applied, SEL Web 8.5, or SEL Web Cloud running, um, and uh, basically fully configured on that. Um, for the model service, you need to install a hotfix. Um, the details of that are all listed in the documentation as well. Okay, next question. Does the DXA reserver override the option to prevent publishing of the linked items available on the advanced option in the publish dialog? Paul, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, so it does, unfortunately. Um, there is no uh, checks at this moment in time. So once the resolver has been installed, yeah, it will override it. So yeah, by, by default then, if you have the resolver enabled, um, which is the default option, it will override it. Um, you can, of course, uh, uh, disable the, the, uh, the resolver itself. Um, uh, but not, uh, but it's currently not following indeed the uh, the advanced options in the publishing dialog. Next question: What is the role of contact service in the X82.0? Uh, Paul, is this something we should discuss now, or is it maybe something we can uh, we can answer in uh, in tomorrow's webinar better? Um, well, uh, it's. It's simple to answer. It's the same as it, it always has been. So the context service is used uh, if you specify a different uh, media uh, helper uh, in your Unity. So for doing the uh, the sizing of the images and so on. I think, I think that's what they're asking. Um, so it, it, there's no there's no there's no effect uh, for the context service. Context service is used because the model service is only for getting page content and so on. It's not getting binary content and things like that. That's it. That's uh, not sure if that answers the question. Okay, doke. Thanks. Okay. Next question. Do you provide predefined Docker image for the microservice? So at this point, we don't. Um, we do have uh, uh, Docker containers um, uh, and Docker images, uh, therefore, um, on the roadmap for the next releases. Hopefully, they'll be part of, uh, of DXA 2.1. Um, and then also, uh, size 9 is, uh, is scheduled to come out with, uh, with uh, Docker uh, containers for uh, all the content delivery microservices. Next question, all of these distributed caching and other caching be supported in Java too? It is already supported in Java. The, with small difference between .NET and Java, the, all the caches work quite sim in a similar way. The only thing that Java doesn't have is uh, distributed caching support, but CIL does support distributed caching, only DXA doesn't. So you can configure DXA to use in-memory caching, but CL you can configure 
at the same time to use distributed caching. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions uh, for today. No, uh, we, we just have got two more in. Okay, we, we have uh, one more question. Okay, next question is uh, in the future, the X8.0 will support the .NET uh, Core 2.0? Um, so, yeah, we do have uh, .NET uh, Core 2.0 support uh, on our roadmap. Um, currently, it is already possible um, to, to use some of the .NET Core features, um, but we don't have a, a version of DXA which, which uses the, the latest MVC, and I think out of my heart, I'm not so good at that, that it was like uh, .NET Core MVC or MVC 6 or something. Um, that will require quite some changes in uh, in the current DXA uh, framework. Um, so that's not on on the very short term. I'm not expecting it in the 2.1 release. Next question we have for the last Docker comment: a Docker containers or a Docker file in the instrument media. Uh, I can't. Uh, I, I can't quite answer that exactly yet. Um, we will definitely uh, have Docker containers. We might also have Docker files, but yeah, we need to see. I mean, it's uh, it's planned for the future, so I don't have enough details for that. Okay. Next question: Will discovery service still function the same? Uh, so I think uh, the, the, the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, DXA uh, does not have control over the discovery service. Discovery service is part of our content delivery framework. Um, so the functionality of the discovery service is still the same. Um, uh, a slight thing added in there is that uh, the discovery service now also knows about the DXA model service. But that is not changing the way the discovery service functions. Okay, thank you. So these are all the questions from today. So I'm going to wrap it up the webinar today. Thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope it is useful and informative to you. We look forward to sharing the webinar recording with you shortly. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.